Well, good evening and welcome to the live stream on the 11th of October 2022. Martin North from Digital Finance and the Liz here. Great to have you on the show tonight. And uh, thanks for taking some of your Tuesday outs to spend it with us. Um, some of the old faithfuls here again and also a few new names too. So it's great to see everybody on. And just before I bring Leith in, I'll just do what I always do is just remind you about uh, the fact we're not providing specific financial or legal advice. It's the general conversation only. The chat room is moderated, so just bear that in mind. But I do encourage you to share your thoughts and opinions and uh, tick tac with each other in the chat. This is as of the 11th of October 2022. If you'd like to ask a question, and we do encourage that, use at Walk the World to get my attention. That then puts the queue in, that puts the question into my queue, which means I get to see it and then can post it up. And I've also enabled Super Chat so that if you want to get your question top of the top of the list, you can do that or indeed make a contribution to what we do and uh, that's always greatly appreciated and uh, just to uh, say to uh, Jason thanks for the super chat there Jason and uh, yeah 75 base points I've only got four options in my poll so I had to sort of pick a pick a few but uh, it will be interesting to see uh, to see what we think there anyway let, without further ado let me bring Leith in Leith hello g'day Martin g'day everyone nice to be on again yeah, it seems like time flies, isn't it? It's a couple of months, but uh, very interesting times. And look, you know, I think everything's in sort of hyper speed at the moment. Things are moving very quickly. A lot of um, cross currents, uh, a lot of different uh, dimensionality to, to what's actually in play. And trying to make all sense of it is well, it's quite fun, isn't it, really? Yeah, it is. It is. I said this last time I was on uh, this last sort of 12 months. I actually really started this since the start of this year has been probably the most enjoyable uh, time to be a, you know, commentator, blogger, or whatever you want to call it, uh, in the last sort of 10 years, really. Um, you know, sort of unprecedented times. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here for the drama. <laughs> yeah, the, the drama and the blood sport, I think, is probably the way to think about it. Now, for those who don't know you, Leith, um, just give you the chance to give you the sort of the one minute whistle stop tour, because of course, Economist you are, but you've had an interesting contextual journey to get to this point, which is just worth I think, underscoring. Yeah, no worries. Well, yeah, I studied um, commerce at University of Melbourne Uni, did a major in economics, uh, worked a crap job at Ford Credit for about a year or so, and then realised, hang on, I should have just used what I learned at uni. Uh, then went to the Australian Treasury, worked as an economist there for three years. Uh, then went to the Victorian Treasury for a year uh, when I moved back to Melbourne. Uh, then went to Goldman Sachs for five years. Um, didn't work as an economist, worked as a regulatory capital guy. Um, so basically whenever they did a loan or whatever, had to calculate the capital that had to be held aside. And then um, and then been doing macro business for the last decade, the last, well, 11th year, I think it is. Uh, and also, uh, you know, Nucleus Wealth as well uh, with MB Fund. Um, so, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a great journey. And uh, who would have thought when... Dave Well and Smith and I started up Macro Business 10 or so years ago that we'd still be doing it a decade later. And if anything, it's probably, uh, you know, it's probably bigger than it's ever been right now, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's um, nice the way that's all connected with Nucleus. And, uh, you know, you come on my channel as well. And we're sort of spreading the word and trying to spread greater intelligence and understanding about what's going on, which I think in the current environment is uh, is pretty important. Now, what we should just do before we forget is just remind everybody that on the 19th of October in Melbourne in the evening, there is a chance to meet Leith and the other macro business guys and Nucleus Wealth guys in person. You can uh, go register. There's a link in the um, comments below this uh, show on YouTube. And uh, it's about an hour and a half, and they're going to talk a little bit about what's going on. Um, I'll be joining virtually because um, I can't uh, figure out doggy sitting in, in, in that time frame. So, um, but it's going to be a very interesting and important event. It's the first time for two or three years, I think, that uh, it's been uh, uh, run. Um, Leith, anything to add with regards to the event? No, no, it's just this is the first one, uh, as you said, since 2019. So we, we used to do these um, annually. So we did, I think, the uh, we used to do a roadshow the first time around where we basically went all around the country and then uh, the next year we did a few of those, uh, went to various states and then there was a couple in Melbourne and then obviously COVID's hit so we haven't been able to do this for, for a number of years. Um, so yeah, just come along if you want to meet me and the others. It's always, um, yeah, it's always, you know, pretty good fun. We don't like, there's obviously a serious element to it but it's also, um, you know, there's always a bit of humour in there as well 
and and anybody who knows Dave Wilde and Smith knows that he's a, he's a pretty funny guy as well. So, um, <laughs> yeah, come along if you can, just in Melbourne, uh, Wednesday week. So, yeah, not long yeah. now. So be uh, there or be square, as I say. Exactly. Well, the links links are below there. We've already had a number of people register, which is great, but uh, plenty of space to. Uh, you know, go along and um, meet meet the guys. Excellent. Well, now let's go on and talk specifically economics then, Leith. And I think we we, we got to really we got to really start with house prices, haven't we? Because that really is the um, you know the nexus where so many things come together. Um, and and look, it's interesting also. I think contextualising what's happening in Australia with New Zealand, right? Because we got twenty five basis points from the RBA. They did fifty. Fifth one in a row. Fifth one in a row. Um, their rates above th- their cash rates above three percent. Ours is still in the t- in the twos, but I guess it's down, down, and down and down, isn't it, with regard to prices? Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, for both for for, for both nations, really. Um, you know, Australia's uh, Australia obviously was a bit later the party than New Zealand, but we're we're actually catching up pretty quick. And um, I think the reason for that is, uh, for starters, are uh, Reserve Bank meets every four weeks, whereas over there they meet every six. And that's the same across most developed countries, actually. We we meet more rapidly. And also, Australia is the highest proportion of variable rate mortgages in the world. So what that means is that um, whenever the Reserve Bank lifts interest rates, it feeds directly into mortgages very quickly, like far quicker here than anywhere else in the world. And what that means is, and, and also because we've got the second highest debt loads in the world, um, it means that Australian households are especially sensitive to rate rises. Uh, more <laughs> I'm not so just making the point that number one is Switzerland, but yeah, Switzerland is, is... <laughs> a financial, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so I mean, among yeah. real economies, as it were, among those that don't have the overlay of, you know, international money, money laundering and everything else, uh, yeah. we, we're, well, we're in a, you know, class of one, really. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, it was certainly, certainly the very, the very top. Um, so yeah, Australia, Australia's obviously, you know, incredibly indebted. We've also got, the highest sensitivity of mortgage rate rises because we've got so many people on variable rate mortgages. And what that means is that obviously when the RBA hikes rates, it has a bigger impact here than it would in most other countries, including New Zealand, because New Zealand's obviously got extraordinarily expensive housing. I'd actually argue it's probably slightly worse than Australia, slightly less mortgage debt for some reason, but they've uh, got a much higher proportion of fixed rate mortgages. So their, their mortgage structure is different. Only about 10% of their mortgages are actually floating. Um, they have about half a sort of floating or just over half a floating or one year or less fixed. So it still does you know, move. Um, and then the rest of them are fixed. So uh, because of that, although the RBNZ started hiking earlier and sort of this time last year, um, we're actually catching up quicker because we have that higher sensitivity to mortgage rate. Um, yeah, increases. Absolutely. Well, let's start with, with with Aussie. And in fact, you put a very nice slide together, which we might just show, right? So this is actually what's happening with regards to Australian prices. That's and it's right. Quite yeah. interesting, isn't it? So Sydney's down what nine point six now? Yeah. So so this is taken as as of the most recent core logic data, which is taken today from yesterday. Mm. And uh, yeah, so so Sydney's down nine point six percent from peak. Melbourne's down six. Brisbane's down 5.3, and Adelaide and Perth are pretty late to the party. They're only down 0.6 each. And that makes a five-city capital index of minus 6.1. So if you were to add the regions and the other capitals, it would probably be 5.7 or something nationally. Um, it'd be slightly less. But, you know, regardless, that's that's all happened uh, since, since May pretty much. Well, the house prices nationally peaked in April. And um, they're now down, as I said, 6.1% across the five cities. And the chart on the right there uh, actually plots this correction against prior episodes all the way back to 1980. So I've got, I've, I'm fortunate enough to have CoreLogic data back to 1980. And from that, I can plot the, you know, the compare all the busts that we've had. And this one's obviously, you know, got a fair way to go before it meets the record bust of 2017-18, which was uh, nearly 11% over 21 months. But it's a hell of a lot quicker. And, you know, it, I think we can, it'd be very safe to say that we're going to beat that, uh, the 2017-18 the peak to trough decline, I think quite comfortably based on what's going on. Even if the RBA didn't, didn't hike rates anymore, which I think they will, uh, we'd probably still beat it because there's a lag between when mortgage rates rise and their impact. And it takes, you know, it can take months to work its way through the system. So, uh, well, yeah. And there's just sort of work that through because there's two, two observations. The first is 
when the RBA announces, they go through a process, the banks deliberate, they then have to post the notices, then they have to advise yeah. people, and then it actually hits accounts, right? Yeah, so Gareth Ed, uh, CBA's chief economist, he, he he did the numbers on what how CBA works, mm. and I'm sure the banks are you know, all pretty similar. And he, he said it's like a three-month lag between rate rise and when it hits um, CBA mortgage accounts. Um, other other institutions that can be less, can be quicker. But he said on average it's two to three months. So the rate rise we had last Tuesday um, won't start impacting most mortgage holders for you know at least two months from now. So because of that, there's an inherent lag. And we and um, Gareth used the fantastic expression and said it's uh, it's like the RBA has taken five shots of vodka. Uh, well, actually, six now. I think it's six rises. Now? Yeah, it is six. Yeah. yeah, six. six yep. yeah, so, so six shots of vodka in an hour, and wondering why they're not yet drunk because <laughs> they've done back to back to back to back. Like, you know, yeah. six months in a row, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. It's really six over five months because the first one in May, then April is a month, and you get two two rate rises. So they've taken, um, you know, these incredibly, sh- you know, uh, quick interest rate rises, quick shots of vodka, but it hasn't. We haven't felt the impact of it yet. And it's like they're they're hiking continuously because they don't feel drunk yet. But you know it's going to hit. Um, it's a matter of time. And you know this is unusual to hike rates this aggressively so quickly because it takes a while to actually feel the impact. And the risk, as always, is that they're going to go too far. And then by the time it actually hits you, and you do get drunk. You get absolutely blasted, uh, way more than you ever wanted to, and you're vomiting over over in the pit over there, in the gutter. Um, so luckily. You know, I was, I was actually relieved and uh, I can't say impressed with the RBA, but I was actually happy that they did 0.25 last week because um, everyone was, you know, the, the financial markets, Westpac, Morgan Stanley, a whole bunch of them were all egging on 50, 50 basis point rise. And for once, the RBA seemed to, you know, acknowledge that, oh, hang on, we don't know what the impact is yet. Uh, we probably should take a slightly more cautious approach. So, uh, yeah, that was actually a pleasant surprise. But... Then I've also got this devil on my shoulder that's always here, the 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 Scheudenfrau belief, who's like, oh, I just go fifty. I want to see what happens. <laughs> uh, even though I know it's it's not good, shouldn't do it. Um, you know, I've got I've got some I've got some mates of mine who like one of them bought a house recently. Uh, you know, like some people go, oh, so what? Bad luck, whatever. But you know, this guy's got two young kids, and he didn't do it because he wanted to. It's just he sold his apartment. He's been trying to get a. He's got a two bedroom apartment. He's Got two young kids, four people living in two bedroom apartment, needed a bigger place, haven't struggling to rent anything, end up buying it. And anyway, it's just bad timing. Um, you know, uh, th- th- there's a lot of people in that situation who weren't greedy, but are going to get smashed by this just because they bought it at the wrong time for personal reasons, not because not, not, not they were greedy. And, you know, I hate to see that sort of thing happen. So, but then, they, then at the same time, I've got this devil on the shoulder is like, oh, just keep going, RBA. I want to see what happens. Because <laughs> it's kind of an experiment that I've never seen before and probably, you know, may never see it again in my lifetime, uh, even though I know it's absolutely foolhardy and stupid thing to do. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting. I mean, Cookie asked an interesting question. He said he was happy with 25, but what happens when the Fed does 75 or 1% next time around, right? The exchange rate's already dropping. It's about 62 at the moment. And I suppose the differential will actually. Um, probably get to even further ahead if the if if the Fed goes aggressively, it looks like they're going to. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that's the whole problem. Like the Fed's risking blowing up the world at mm. the moment because they're yep. um they, they're they're basically like the 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 interest rate setter, I suppose. Yep. So they they they've been uber bullish or uber hawkish, raising rates ultra aggressively, and other countries are trying to you know catch up so they don't get this massive currency differentiation, which means their currency sorry the interest rate differentiation, so their currency doesn't tank. Which then lifts imported inflation. So you know everything, everything from oil prices, and especially a place like Australia, where just about everything we consume is imported, the costs go up. So yeah, there, there is a risk that the Fed is um, is going to blow up the whole the whole system by being too aggressive. Uh, at the same time, though, I sort of want to like I prefer to see the RBA still focus on domestic issues. Like we don't have wage growth like they're doing the Fed uh, in, in the US. Um, the US wages are rocketing. Like they, they do genuinely, they do have genuine uh, internally driven inflation through wages, et cetera. We've also, unlike the US, we've got the high, we've got much higher exposure to household debt for the reasons said before. So we're way more sensitive. The US also has, you know, predominantly really long fixed rate mortgages, which means that their households aren't as sensitive to interest rate rises as we are. 
because you know if someone's on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage and rates rise it only impacts those who want to buy a house not those who've already got a mortgage um so we're so we're far more sensitive than they are so the rba needs to take all this stuff into, into account obviously um but yeah that is the risk like the the the, the federal reserve going too aggressive and then everyone else playing you know um basically playing follow the leader and then leading to a an absolute global you know recession next year and a global house price bust i think that's pretty much on the cards now well jamie darman the uh man who seems to know some of these things basically said recession coming within nine months in the u.s oh absolutely yeah, oh, yeah for sure and i think the developed world uh, i mean probably the developing world as well but mm. the um especially i think right across the developed world you got soaring energy costs obviously which is you know helping to fuel the inflation um you know a lot of that's due to the uh obviously the russia ukraine thing smashing supply and then you've got obviously opec now is trying to restrict all supply because they want to basically make as much money as they can before everyone before the ship to renewables um so and you know so um yeah the, and then and then you obviously have all the central banks lifting aggressively by the bank of japan so um pretty much it's looks like a it's you know we're, we're, we're all on the same treadmill to to recession unfortunately yeah and of course the, um, the, the, the dxy is way high which means that the us dollar is dominant and of course it's having huge issues look at japan right and korea they're they're trying to sort of you know deal with it by using um um that you know buying and selling to try and hold the <laughs> hold it together and interestingly a lot of the um the banks around the world are actually chucking treasuries us treasuries yeah no no it's just yeah it's a bizarre time it really is it's it, it's um yeah, so look, I was away the previous two weeks, not last week, the two weeks before I was in the Gold Coast. I was sort of working part time, had a school holidays and stuff. So I missed a lot of this stuff. And um, I was still working a bit, but I wasn't following as closely as I usually do. And in that time, the um, the UK government obviously tried to, you know, push through their uh, stage three tax cuts on steroids. Like they, it was, it was like real, basically in a matter of days, turned the UK into basically a banana republic. <laughs> Uh, developing, you know, so so like what are the yeah what are these emerging market dodgy economies? Um, it, it was yeah, I, I actually didn't really. I sort of read a headline, but I wasn't tracking it too much. It was kind of on holidays. I was half on holidays, and then I spoke to Dave, going, "Oh, what's this? You know, UK stuff." And he, he gave me the rundown of it, and it was just like, "My God, yep. um, yeah." And and you know, this is all. You've got the world's biggest financial center in UK, and you know you've got the the UK government effectively handing out these grossly unfair, unaffordable tax cuts, which the central bank was going to basically do quantitative easing to pay for. It was just, a, it was lunacy. Um, but that's, you know, that's that that's sort of uh, idiot stuff we're seeing at the moment. Um, plenty of you know, idiot, across plenty the world. of idiocy. And it's interesting, of course, because the Bank of England then announced uh, up to a, Forty billion pounds worth of intervention, right? Of basically, yeah, yeah, that's what right, support bonds, the currency. Right? Yeah, they actually just... only spent under five billion so far, right? But then yesterday, they announced further tranches uh, in the same vein for longer. So basically, yeah. they're trying to put a finger in the dike, and it's just worth reflecting on this: the one trillion pound pension fund funds in the uk sitting on long-term bonds trying to get more returns by leveraging them up and then getting margin calls and the only thing they could do was to sell <laughs> those treasuries that that was what was happening right yeah, yeah. And, and the 30 the 30 year is now almost where it was the 10 year in the uk is back to where it was um before the the bank of england intervention so it's not fixed it's not solved this no nah, no nah. it's just uh yeah just, just idiocy. But I mean, it just goes to show what can happen if you, you know. Obviously, obviously, the 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 government over there didn't didn't foresee any of this stuff. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know what they what, what well, they're doing. Well, you know, they, they were wedded to trickle down, right? So yeah, that's so it, Reaganomics, that's it. Reaganomics, Reaganomics, and the Laffer curve, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, never mind anything else. Never mind where we are in reality, you know. Um, so it was it was stubborn doctrinal thinking that's caught them into all the time. They've had to backpedal on all sorts of yeah. fronts. And yep. we'll continue to do so, I think. But um, it, it, again, it sort of highlights the fragility. But the, the liquidity or lack of liquidity in bonds around the world is actually a really critical issue at the moment. It's creating a huge amount of stress and stress and strain in the system, in my view. Yeah, for sure. So, 
Anyway, good, well, it's good fun. Yeah, it is absolutely. <laughs> well, let's go back to to talk about the the, the, the mortgages in Australia a little, a little bit more, right? Because this move, which happened really quickly, right, is having a significant impact on on typical repayments, right? Oh, totally, totally. So. Basically, uh, so if you look at the chart on the left, that's basically the um, I plotted the RBA's discount variable mortgage rate, so from their series, and and added the changes in the official cash rate because it's you know it's, it's about two months behind. Um, and what it effectively shows you that, that Australia's discount variable mortgage rate, so this is the average across the system, according according to the RBA, is at five point nine five percent, and that's the highest it's been for a, a full decade. And what this has done in the table directly below it. That shows you what the change in average repayments has been um, since the start of the interest rate cycle in uh, in May. Sorry, uh, as of October, got five point nine five percent mortgage rate. In April, before the first rate hike, was three point four five percent. So, what the table shows you is that for someone, for someone on a five hundred thousand dollars mortgage, their, their repayments have gone up seven hundred fifty fifty dollars a month, which is thirty four percent, just based on the increase in mortgage rates to date. Um, and obviously, you know, if it's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, it's more, and you know, million dollars is double that again. But it's a thirty four percent increase uh, since since the first rate hike in May, which is absolutely extraordinary increase in you know really an incredibly short period of time. And uh, the financial, the hilarious thing is, I, I sort of put this in for comedy, but the bond market, I went and checked it today. Um, they're still tipping, they're still uber bullish on uh, on on the official cash rate. They're they're, they're still tipping a cash rate of 3.85% by September next year, so just in 11 months. So what that would mean is we're at 26 at the moment. The bond market's tipping, they're going to have another 1.25% increase in, uh, in in the official cash rate by um, basically a year's time. And what, what that would do, that would lift the variable mortgage rate to 7.2% and would lift three payments 52% above what they were in April uh, before the first rate hike. So. You know, it's already been massive increase, and if the financial markets are right, it's going to be even more. I don't think they are right, but then again, you know, I I, I didn't think we'd get this far. So, um, but certainly the RBA doing a 0.25 percent hike last Tuesday uh, suggests that we're probably towards the end of the rate hiking cycle. Uh, they did say in there that there's um, they expect further further increases in the months ahead, but to me that reads like a couple 0.25s it probably doesn't mean another 1.25 percent like the markets are saying but you never know um yeah but e even even when they get to the end we're probably still looking at a 40 percent increase in mortgage mm. repayment well there's two huge. two observations the first is even the rba is saying those rates will stay higher for longer yeah so that there's are. no expectation of them coming down and then well, i think they will but personally because i think we'll be in a hardcore recession in this this time next year and, and uh, like I, I think they'll, they'll be forced to cut mid next right. year okay and i think central banks across the world will because i think they're gonna have a global recession but but you know based on um at the moment they they seem to think it's gonna be high for long and, and there's no way that they were going to go back to what they were pre-covid uh, sorry at uh, even pre-covid when cash rate was 0.9 and I, I can't see it getting back to that if they have to slash they'll probably slash to one and a half or something like that mm. So I think the days of um, you know the rates we had pre-COVID, let alone what we had over COVID, when it hit point one, I think those days are over. Yeah, I think they probably learned a lesson or two. And it's interesting because you, you mentioned the ASX thirty. This is the one from today. Oh and yeah, it's actually gone up slightly higher oh, yeah, again. Today. So so it was four point three when the the Bank of England intervened, and it then this is She's up to four now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so in the last time, mine's a day old. It's yeah, well, gone up another, the, another bloody the, fifteen basis points. Out, I wanted to make that point. I don't think I've ever seen so much volatility out that far. No. Right? I mean, we've gone from 4.3 down to 3.5 or 3.6, and now we're back up to 4. Wow. Um, and, and the thing is, only a week ago, they were tipping, I think, 3.55 was the peak in June, and then they were tipping to start falling. That's exactly right. So it's just like, you know, you know it's like, it's seriously, throw, throw a coin in the air and or put, do this one, because that, that's, that's what it is yep. at the moment. Yep. Um, but... You know, some people will say, "Well, the bond markets probably have a better call than, the, than Mr. Lowe." Bearing in mind, he said no interest rate rises until twenty twenty four, right? Yeah, so. but I mean, look, there's just so much. No one knows, but but all we know yeah. is the day of cheap mortgages are over, and yep. um, it's going to hurt. So even if we got no further rise now, you still, you know, it's still a one third increase in mortgage repayments. That, that's in about five months or so, or six, so five and a half months. It's a hell of a hell, you know, hell of a massive increase. 
So Mr Chalmers today came out and said the RBA should be lifting rates more aggressively because it's killing the exchange rate. God, I'll tell you, I, I hate Jim Chalmers. I'll tell you that much. Like, I, I'm not going to mince words here. That guy is the biggest tosser I've ever seen. So basically, yeah, oh, my God. Where do you start with this one? So you got the so, so you got the chicken man. We call him Chicken Chalmers on uh, macro business. So Chicken Chalmers came out today and said, the energy shock, the rise in energy prices is Australia's biggest inflation risk. Of course it is. Yeah, absolutely it is. But then he says, oh, the RBA has got to hike interest rates more because we're getting out of whack with the Federal Reserve and we don't want the currency to fall too much because that'll raise inflation. It's like, hey, Earth the idiot. The biggest domestic risk to inflation is energy prices, which you can do something directly about by solving, out, solving East Coast gas. We are the only... The east coast of Australia is the only gas exporter in the world. We are the biggest export. Well, Australia is the biggest exporter of gas in the world. The east coast is part of that. It's the only market in the world where we don't reserve gas for domestic use. And what? And 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 his idiot government two weeks ago signed an agreement with the gas cartel, which is foreign owned, partly owned by the Chinese Communist Party, who, who has a stake in some of the export trains, um, to basically lock in. Net, uh, LNG netback, which is global uh, gas prices. So, so the gas cartel has signed an agreement agreeing to supply the domestic economy with enough gas as long as they do it at the international price. Now, it's like, why the hell is Australia, who is the biggest gas exporter in the world and produces a ton of the gas, charging its own citizens mm. the international gas price, which has been interrupted by the war in Ukraine? It's like that, 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 that's akin to saying to a Saudi Arabian, no, you've got to pay Australian petrol prices at the pump. It's like, hang on, but the oil comes out here and we sell it to the rest of the world. We're, we're, we're swimming in the stuff. And you expect me to play the same as what a European pays or, you know, who imports the stuff. It doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, we've got the, so we've got the chicken man whose government could easily solve this situation with a stroke, a stroke of a pen by reserving domestic gas and, in, and, implementing a super profits tax on the mining companies who are making absolute obscene war profits. I've got, I've got a chart there if you want to bring it up. Um, you know, This is the energy shock one? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the energy shock one. So, so the, these two charts are classic. They just show you the situation. Like pictures it tells a thousand words. Hmm. Chart on the left, this comes from the AFR as of June quarter. Um, a, uh, a energy consultant created this chart, the AFR published it. And it's probably the best visual representation you can see of what's going on. So at the bottom here, we've got Western Australia. So Western Australia produces a ton of gas. They were also smart enough under the Carpenter government years and years ago to reserve 15% of their domestic gas production, for, uh, sorry, of their gas production for domestic use. And what's that done, what, what that's done is it's pegged their domestic gas price to the lowest level in the world. They're paying about $5.75 a gigajoule for gas. Us on the East Coast, where 70% of our gas goes to China, right? We were paying up to $30 a gigajoule for gas in the June quarter. It's actually, you know, it got higher than that at one point. Uh, currently, as of today, it's about 20 something dollars. And that is one of the highest gas prices in the world. You've got all these other countries here, like UK is paying the most. Uh, Taiwan's paying about twenty dollars fifty. Uh, you know, they're all they're all gas importers, and they're buying a lot of them are buying our gas. And 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 the biggest insult is China, who gets seventy percent of our east coast gas, seventy one percent of east coast gas is paying on average eighteen dollars a gigajoule, whereas we were paying up to thirty dollars. And it comes out here. And 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 the, and the most ridiculous thing is, we lose about ten percent of the gas when we liquefy it. So we pull it out of the ground, right? These these gas export trains are incredibly energy hungry. It takes a lot of energy to then turn it into a liquid. So they can put it on a ship, condense it, put it on a ship, and then ship it halfway across the world, deliquefy it, it back into gas so they, they can burn it. So we so they burn about 10% of the gas. They waste 10% of it just to turn into liquid. So then we can sell it cheaper than we sell it to Australians. It's just completely bonkers. And We've got Australia's got this controlled experiment where we have one jurisdiction in the country, Western Australia, who's doing the reservation, and we've got the East Coast, which isn't doing reservation. West Coast, the Western Australians are paying the lowest gas prices and electricity prices in the world because gas sets the electricity price. Whereas us on the East Coast, where we've got policy corrupt politicians, 
of paying some of the highest energy prices in the world, gas prices and and surging electricity prices. And the electricity companies came out today and said, oh, or yesterday, and they and they came out and said, oh, you know, electricity prices, energy prices are going to rise at least 35% next year. That's on top of the 25% increase we've had this year, purely because, well, really largely because the gas prices exploded because we've got these foreign-owned energy cartels basically gouging us, sending our gas offshore and fleecing us because we've got no reservation. Uh, if you, and if you just go back to that, Martin, if you don't mind, there's another chart here which I didn't actually talk to, I should have, okay. um, which just shows you how absurd. The chart on the right here, this comes from the national accounts. Alex Joyner at IFM Investors put it together. And it shows that the mining companies, so Australia's miners made $81 billion of profits, gross operating profits in the uh, June quarter, compared to every other company in Australia, which made about $70 billion. And you can see the massive increase there. That that huge increase where it's gone through the roof is because of these soaring, you know, gas and coal prices because of the war in Ukraine. So that so they they are making absolute super profits, and we're not getting anything for it except higher prices. It's absolutely absurd. So so here we have Chicken Chalmers, who's who's talking, he's pontificating about inflation. Oh, it's the biggest inflation challenge, and then egging on the RBA to smash households with more interest rate rises to prevent inflation. When he can do something about it directly by policy, and this is what one thing I hate the most. And I and I when I worked at the Treasury, um, you know, fifteen or so years ago, I remember one of the dep secretaries there told me he said, "Oh, you know, uh, we we you know we don't manage the economy. The RBA does." It's like what well, the RBA's got one instrument. It's like it's up to you guys to actually do some. You, you guys control this this sort of thing. Um, do something about it. Like this whole energy disaster started under the Rudd Gillard government when they allowed these export trains to be set up without reservation. It's up to them to bloody fix it. They're in government now. We're getting absolutely fleeced. It's going to get worse. And you know, once the European winter hits and their gas demand goes up even more, the price is going to surge even more. And why the hell should we be paying world prices when it comes out of the ground down the road? Mm. Absurd. And, and, and well, the key point here is electricity is priced off the marginal gas cost of gas right and, and, and that's why wa's electricity yep. price is low yep. lowest in the world because their gas is cheap yep and they've actually managed to get off coal because they burn gas instead which is way cleaner we're, we're stuck still burning coal and then we can't afford to you know pivot more to gas because we can't afford it um it's just absurd it's just the ultimate this is australia's biggest policy failure right now and then and this is why it you know angers me so much when you see chicken charmers in his group whinge about inflation, you know, put the hands in, oh, we can't do anything about it. It's like, yes, you can. It, stroke of a pen, you could do it. You, it just requires some courage to stand up to these foreign-owned gas cartels. And I tell you what, if they do it, the Australian people will, will reward them. And if they don't do it, they will punish them mm. because soon all our gas and electricity prices are going to rocket. And that's going to hurt us all. And, and this is a government who's come who got voted in on the back of easing cost of living. Instead, they're going to hurt it. And um, you know, there is some discussion that if they were to do that and impose those um, those uh, hurdles and what have you on the uh, international uh, corporations, they could get sued, or they could, you know, they talk about um, you know the the, the risks to the um, uh, you know the, the sovereign how, risk. Sovereign risk is the word I'm such sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. well, yeah. I mean, there's an easy way around it. You take it from China. And sorry, mm. China it screwed us on so many areas. Uh, whether it's, you know, wine, whatever, right? They, they don't follow by the rules. 71% of uh, East Coast gas goes to China, right? They don't even need it. Like, they're, they're, they're actually got too much of the stuff and they're re-exporting. So they're basically um, subcontracting our gas for profit to Europe. So, so they've, they've ordered too much from us, which they've got at long, long-term long contract prices, which are way cheaper than, than what we're paying. And they don't need it. So they're actually on-selling it to Europe at a profit and they're making bank. Um, and, you know, my, my whole thing is it's like China's not really our friend. They're not, you know, if you look at everything they've done, they're actually kind of almost a rogue state at the moment. Um, they're also getting Russian gas on the sly too. They're, they're ignoring sanctions. And also they've, China have done the exact same thing with, with urea. So urea is used uh, in diesel fuel and fertiliser. Um, you might probably heard the term AdBlue. So AdBlue is like an additive you put in diesel fuel to make it burn cleaner. China has 80% of the world's um, AdBlue, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, urea stocks. And last year, China, to keep their costs down for their, for their 
domestic industry banned the export of urea, right? And that totally screwed over Australia and it screwed over other countries because suddenly we didn't have this additive for diesel, which is required for, um, for you know, to be able to, for, for emissions reasons. And that's that's left us in a pickle, and the rest left the rest of the world pickle. But but I mean, to be honest with you, there from China's point of view, I don't blame them. It's like mm. they're looking after their own industry and their own their own uh, users, and and if it's their resource, it should be used for them first. But we should be able to do the same. So why isn't sovereign risk that China can't ban the export of urea, which we need it, and other countries need, but it's sovereign risk if we curb our exports to China? Like it, it's it's complete BS, and. Um, you know that if you if you if you're worried about not angering the world, like like you obviously don't want to um, hurt your allies, but China's not an ally, so just take a bit from them. They're, they're as I said, they're not even using it; they're actually re reselling it to Europe for a profit. So um, you know what the hell are we doing here? You get, uh, I don't want to sound like a nationalist, but it's Australia first here when it comes to our energy and our resources. Or, or at least if you don't want to reserve the gas, put a super profits tax on it so we at least get a return on it. Mm. And then we can use that to subsidise our users, use electricity prices. But, you know, either way, the fact of the matter is doing nothing like not having a reservation and not having a super profits tax is basically hurting us. It's, it, gas is one area where the more we export, it's totally perverse. The more we export, the poorer we get. We'd be better off if someone went in there and blew up the bloody gas, the gas export terminals. We'd, we'd all be richer all of a sudden because our gas price would tank. And the profits are going offshore anyway. Yep. Um, the most absurd thing that happened in the national accounts is we had record trade surplus, but at the same time we had a record income deficit, net income deficit. And when you actually read the details, what the ABS says is because we had a record number of dividends flow offshore because of because the mining uh, the the um, mining company is ninety five percent foreign owned, so they all made money and then just went offshore anyway. So it's like well. What good was that to us? We just end up paying higher prices. It's like a we, we're getting the private tax effectively because all our energy prices have rocketed, but we're not getting any of the gains from this stuff. So if you don't want to do reservation for those sovereign risk reasons, we'll do a super profits tax then. Yeah, um, they've, got, you know, they've got options, but the question is, um, would they be worried about upsetting those big international corporations and you know well, what donations have been made by whom and how? Yeah, yeah, how right, right, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, they're obviously upset about it. I mean, so they're obviously worried about it. Yep. But my response is, who gives a toss? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'd be far more concerned about upsetting, you know, 20 million voters. Because those are honestly, obviously the ones who, A, you're meant to represent, and B, are the ones who give you your job. Mm. So the foreign-owned gas cartels don't elect you into office, right? They might bribe you or offer you sweet job post-politics, but it's us. Who determines if you keep your job, and it's us who you're meant to represent. But these, you know, they, these absolute cowards in Labor are refusing to do either. So, you know, I, I honestly can't stand them. I think at the moment, like a lot of people probably throw eggs at me. Like I hated the previous government, but I think this government's worse from what I've seen so far. Because the coalition was scumbags, but at least you knew they were scumbags. So it's like you've got the corrupt. Like in some ways, I prefer a criminal because at least you know they're a criminal than a corrupt cop. I sort of feel like Labor's a corrupt cop. They're smiling and, uh, you know, they've got virtue signaling. They say nice things while they knife you in the back. That's effectively what's going on here uh, with, with, with gas, with immigration. Um, you know, they're, they're kowtowing to China. Uh, all, all the issues I care about, Labor's probably worse on, to be quite honest. Um, and, you know, it's an annoying thing is because they, 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 so, I think you can just say, um, you know, spout out some BS, you know, virtue signaling words like, words like net zero and, you know, we're going to 43% emissions reduction, which, yeah, they're not going to achieve that with their immigration policies. Uh, and then everyone thinks they're great. But when, when, when in, all, in all actuality, when you look at what's going on in rental market, they're going to ramp up immigration. It's going to totally destroy the rental market even more. Um, and on this energy issue, they, they're bloody poor. Uh, and that's the stuff that I sort of care about the most. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm very unimpressed by this current what? government at the moment, but I'm always unimpressed. Like every government that comes in, I'm unimpressed. So yeah, that's nothing new. I was going to say, all, all governments seem to leave me cold because they don't seem to yeah. be doing the things but, that but, are blooming but obvious. But this one's angered me, me more than any other, just because of the energy issue, I think, really, and the immigration issue. So let's just pick, up, pick the immigration, migration issue up a little bit, right? Because this is quite important insofar that some things have been done to basically get 
the approval to open the throttle and allow more people to come in. And there was this sort of big conference in Canberra a few weeks ago that basically was a... It was a Trojan horse. Yes, exactly. It was a Trojan horse and they got what they wanted. We know already that um, there are a lot of education visas being applied for, in fact, very, very high level. So after the, you know, the summer, uh, in the, the next academic year, we're going to see a huge inflow of um, people coming in on the migration through education. And we also know that they've started looking specifically for certain categories of workers with certain capabilities, particularly, for example, in healthcare, technology and those sorts of things. And they've, for example, been um, pushing the barrow out towards China and elsewhere to try and actually bring large numbers in. Now, the question you've got to ask is, why are they doing this, Leith? What, what's driving this massive thought of, we need more people? Oh, a couple of things. You've got the, um, unfortunately, all the, the lobbyists, um, I call them the growth lobby, big business, big property, the education migration industry. Uh, they all want it. So, you know, it's, it, it's if, you're, if you're a part of the, big, the business lobby or the, you know, universities and all that stuff, it's a, win, it's a win-win for you, right? So if you're a big business, you get to lazily, so if you're a Harvey, Harvey Norman, I'll just use that as an example. Could be, you know, Harry Triggerboff of Meriton or whatever. Same, same story. Basically, it's an easy way to grow your profits. So if you've got a whole chain of department stores around the country, you can bring in tons of people, grow your population growth by 2% a year. That's that's basically 2% extra sales, other things equal, but doing nothing. You don't have to improve the way you do it. You just grow your pipe. Um, so it's a win-win for the capitalists. Um, it also means that, you know, you can bring over people who are willing to work for less. So we see this all the time. Um, you hear about, you know, wage, wage theft, exploitation, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, puts downward pressure on wages, so reduces your costs. Uh, so, you know, it's a win-win. Um, for, from a government point of view, they're obviously getting their strings pulled by this by these mobs, but also it's a lazy way to grow the economic pie and it makes you look like you're a better economic manager. So if you're growing the population by 2% every year, well, that's 2% of GDP growth, other things equal, uh, doing nothing. Even though, even if per capita growth treads water, um, nobody cares because unfortunately everything is reported as aggregate, like Unfortunately, the financial media never talks about you know, per capita outcomes, like individual outcomes, et cetera. It's all done as the, as, as, as the one pie. So, you know, governments love mass immigration and high population growth because it makes them look like better economic managers because they can lazily grow the economy even if individually we go backwards. Um, but also, it's a lazy way to grow budget revenues. So if you bring in more, um, more, more people, you know, more people working, uh, bringing more people means, you know, obviously leads to more jobs other than equal, means to more people paying taxes, et cetera. So it grows your revenue. But they never take into consideration the costs. Like you've got to somehow, you've got to provide schooling to these people. You've got to provide extra infrastructure. You've got to provide extra housing. You've got to provide extra welfare, et cetera. But they never account those, those, those costs. And in fact, the last, you know, 20 years of mass immigration or 15 years of mass immigration pre-COVID, we didn't get that stuff provided in adequate quantities because they cut back on all that stuff, which is why we had infrastructure bottlenecks and, all these problems, whether it's you know, uh, in the yeah, you know, before this deluge of rain, we had you know, constant droughts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because we didn't have enough infrastructure. Um, but you know, all that stuff gets glossed aside. So, unfortunately, the Albanese government has committed to the biggest immigration intake in this nation's history. Not only have they increased the permanent migrant intake by thirty-five thousand to a record high, one hundred ninety-five thousand, which is if you add humanitarians. Uh, intake brings it up to about 210, 215. They've also committed to clearing the fake 1 million visa backlog, um, which and as well as they've extended um, work rights for, dramatically increased work rights for international students, which is just going to basically lead to a flood of people from, you know, the, the subcontinent, um, you know, Nepal and other countries where a whole bunch of non-genuine genuine students are going to arrive here basically for work and for permanent residency rather than actually study. And, uh, yeah, so, so Labor, unfortunately, set the train in motion for next year to be the biggest immigration intake in this nation's history. So we've never had net overseas migration breach 315,000. I think next year we're going to absolutely smash it. And, in fact, in the March quarter, uh, this is before Labor got in, we actually had the highest quarterly net overseas migration in the nation's history of 96,000. So it was already starting to ramp up. And part of that's catch-up from COVID, obviously. But... Um, 
you know, Labor's just put a rocket under this after the Jobs and Skills Summit, uh, vowing to, you know, increase permanent and more importantly, temporary migration to levels we've never seen before. So uh, next year, we're going to have a flood of people. And, and, and my concern is twofold. For starters, we've, we've got the tightest rental market in history. Um, you know, rental vacancy rates have never been lower. We've also got double digit rental increases across the nation. So according to Cologic, the rental growth is the highest it's ever been. So what happens when you add literally hundreds of thousands of extra people seeking rental accommodation? You're obviously going to crater rental vacancies, you're going to force up rents even higher, and you're going to push thousands of people into homelessness. And that's effectively the train that Labor has put us on. Um, in addition, uh, obviously, we've got the Reserve Bank of Australia dramatically increasing rates, which is going to, as we've, for reasons we've discussed before, we're probably going to have a recession in Australia next year uh, or a global yeah a global recession which is going to probably lead to a recession here as well so what happens when you massively increase labor supply by hundreds of thousands of people into a dramatically slowing economy we're going to ramp up unemployment massively uh, and then that's going to put downward pressure on wages etc and you're going to be back to the bad old days of chronically high youth unemployment etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so you know it couldn't come at a worse time, really. Uh, worst couldn't come at a worse time for the rental market, and I think also the timing of it is ridiculous. Like everyone's screaming about skill shortages right now, but I guarantee in a year's time we'll, we'll be worried about the opposite. We're we'll worried about unemployment uh, because you know the economy is going to slow at the same time as labour just opens the floodgates. Uh, and my add, this is something that nobody, well, very few Australians actually want. All the opinion polls show that the overwhelming majority of Australians do not want to return to pre-COVID immigration levels or higher because they experienced it firsthand. They experienced the constant crash load infrastructure, the you know, declines in, in amenity, housing affordability, the impacts on the environment, et cetera, et cetera, and they're just their basic quality of life. And yet, Albo, the good old Albo, smiling Albo government is going to ramp it up to levels we've never seen before. So it's another reason why I can't stand them. Because uh, none of this was discussed during the election campaign. They didn't mention that they were going to do this. Um, and then as soon as they got elected, it's bang, back to big Australia with a bullet. Mm. And it's just worth reflecting on this, that uh, before COVID hit, there were about half a million temporary migrants working in Australia, right? which is one of the reasons why the unemployment rate was where it was. They yep. all got kicked out. Yep, and a fantastic labour market. And that's why we've got an unemployment rate that's so low. And uh, employment to populate. So the highest ever effectively share of the work for people in Australia in work. Yep. The same as unemployment fell at a level's not seen since uh, since before, well, basically 1974. Mm. Uh, in my lifetime, I was born in 1978. So, um, yeah, it, you know, we, we, we talk about these controlled experiments. Like with energy, you've got WA and then you've got the rest of the nation. We got the same here. Like we we had a bit of negative migration over over the um, we actually lost some migrants over the pandemic, and the impact on labour market was glorious. Um, so what happens when you do the opposite? Well, obviously you're going to undo those gains. It's not rocket science, mm. and especially when you do it at the same time as the economy is slowing dramatically, well, it will slow dramatically on the back of you know tanking the housing market. Um, Rising interest rates, mortgage holders having to pay a lot more, obviously, which reduces their household consumption. Um, you know, it's not rocket science. And basically, yeah, we got we got labor jacking up our energy costs, and they're gonna, you know, jack up labor supply and crush any chance of having wage growth. So uh yeah, well done, Albo. Yes. And of course the point here is all these people coming into the country need somewhere to live. They're going to obviously be driving around and using all the roads and everything. Uh, and the healthcare system yep. and the education system. So where are the plans to build out the infrastructure to support? There never is. There's never any plans. I mean, you get these, you get these pie in the sky infrastructure projects. Like, you know, it, you, you obviously don't live in Sydney anymore, but you live near Sydney and you're, you're very familiar with Sydney. Now, um, <laughs> You know, I, we, we, I, I we, went away. It was too. It was too chaotic. I decided yeah, to that's right. come well, down it, into the region. <laughs> I think I said last time. Like Sydney probably peaked during the you know the Sydney Olympics in like two thousand one. Yep. Like since then, added a million plus people. Yep. And um, just look at what's happened. You've had, you've gone from probably I don't know. It was probably one or two toll roads back then. You had the Harbour Bridge, and mm. I can't remember. Maybe one other. Now you've got about twenty. And 
the whole place has become one giant transurban toll road where they basically pull money out of your pocket anywhere you go across Sydney. And why is that? It's because they had to build all this infrastructure to accommodate million plus extra people, which you didn't need. But they bought them in, and then the government goes, "Oh, you know, we've got to we've got to solve this congestion problem." But they they bring in all the you know let let let, let the private toll road companies in uh, run rampant. And then now you've basically got everyone having to pay private taxes to toll to Transurban to go anywhere in Sydney to basically use the road system like that, uh, to, to basically travel like they would have before all this madness happened where they, when they used to get it for free. It's just maddening. Uh, you know, and we've got the same sort of crap in Melbourne that's starting to happen. Like we're, we're not as big on the toll roads as Sydney. We do have a couple. But all the plans are for, you know, Melbourne to try and, oh, you know, we've got to cater to Melbourne's doubling of the population in the next 40 years. It's got these harebrained schemes to, like, build this $125 billion outer suburban rail loop, which is going to be point, totally pointless, hardly anyone's going to use. It's the biggest white elephant I've ever seen. But this is basically, um, you know, this is all to keep up with the population Ponzi that nobody wants. Uh, and it's just stupid. The whole thing is just absolute stupid ponzi nomics. Which unfortunately, you know, the idiots of the New South Wales government are all for it. Uh, I'm pretty, actually the Victorian idiot government's for it as well. So, pretty much, pretty much all our political leaders love this stuff for some reason, whereas the citizens hate it. Mm. But they don't represent us. They represent big business, big property, and the education migration industry. Unfortunately, and, and you make a very important point about this is lazy policy, isn't it? It's it's oh, it's simple lazy done. policy. And I also blame point. Treasury. I said this last mm. time. Treasury's got their three P's framework. Yep. Population, participation, productivity. Of those things, only two of them matter. Really, one matters. That's productivity. Anticipation just means you work a bit harder, basically. Mm. Um, but the one that they focus on is the population, which is immigration. Like, you know, the Treasury's wellbeing framework is, oh, you increase Australia's wellbeing by increasing population, i.e. immigration, productivity, anticipation. The last two matter, the first one doesn't, but they focus on the first one. All the first one does is it grows the pie, right? But it doesn't give everyone a bigger slice of that pie. And when you factor in all these other things like, you know, impacts on the environment and impacts on your cost of living, um, you know, your your, your amenity, uh, being able to, you know, only afford a apartment whereas your parents used to live in a house because it's too densely populated now. You don't get to live in a house like your parents did because there aren't, there's enough room for houses anymore because there's too many people. All this stuff is a degradation of your quality of life. And yet, the the politicians are putting us on this, you know, on this fast train to nowhere. Mm. Um, and as I said before, all the opinion polls show that Australians don't want this, but our politicians don't represent us. They represent the growth lobby, which is why we keep getting this garbage. Yeah, that's unfortunately the case. And uh, you know, the the one percent do quite well out of it because, of course, they. Uh, are clipping the ticket on the way through, aren't they? Oh, and, um, mate, High Rise Harry loves it. Yep. Jerry Harvey loves it. Like yep. Those guys are always talking up, oh, we need to get more migrants. Like High, High Rise Harry boasts that most of his sales go to international students. Mm. And he's, you know, you know, he boasts that it's made him rich. Yep. So, well, that's good for you, buddy. I mean, how many billions do you want? Like, how many do you need for a successful life? Like, you know, what about the rest of us? Like, you know, who, who are stuck, um, stuck in traffic now and having to force to live in a High Rise crappy Meriden apartment? when a parents could afford a house. Like it's just all this stuff is is a degradation of quality of life. And the, the most hilarious thing is we've got Albo and his cronies, um, you know, saying we're going to somehow magically achieve a 43% emissions reduction by 2030 or something. Yep. While it while it embarks on the biggest population boom this nation has ever seen. Like it doesn't make sense. How, how can you lower your emissions when you keep increasing the number of emitters? <laughs> like, yeah, um, it, the, it, the, the funniest one was a couple of weeks ago, Dan Andrews, who's the Victorian Premier, um, another flog, basically um, put out a tweet where it showed Victoria's population going up like that, right? And then emissions going down like that to zero. And he's like, oh, this is Victoria's future. We're going to have zero, net zero emissions, and we're going to double our population, basically. It's like, how the hell does that work? Like every single person you get, 25% of the nation's emissions come from buildings, like like building buildings. Buildings and all the stuff around buildings. So it's like, well, if you're going to double your population, you're going to need a hell of a lot more buildings to house those people. So even that just on, on itself is going to raise emissions. And then every one of those people is going to buy a car, is going to have a flat screen TV, is going to you know, need to have a computer and all this other crap. 
that requires emissions to make. Well, so the whole thing is just it's just farcical. It huh? really is. Like all this net zero stuff, mate. Like when uh, look, I'm all for trying to decarbonize and get off dirty fuels and all that sort of stuff. I'm all for that. But come on, don't don't try and sell me that you can somehow magically you know, increase Australia's population by 50% over the next 40 years, which is the intergeneration reports projection, and we're going to magically halve Australia's emissions or whatever. It's not possible. It's just farcical. So, um, yeah, I don't know, mate. It's, it's all BS. It really is. <laughs> it's all virtue signaling. But unfortunately, you know, people, people look at this stuff and they go, everyone focuses so much on emissions, they don't focus on other f- forms of the environment, which to me are a lot more important, like habitat destruction and land clearing and all that sort of stuff, which is made unambiguously worse by mass population growth. Just go and read the, the State of the Environment Report. Mm-hmm. But nobody focuses on that. They just focus on this net emissions, you know, this sort of bland, like, broad thing they can virtue signal about while they ignore all this other destruction going on. Um, you know, I, I find it incredibly infuriating. Yeah, well, that's understandable. I have to say I'm of the same mind, really. Yeah. It seems so two-dimensional. You know, we yeah. here, here we are with um, um, a unique opportunity in Australia because you know we've got a significant land mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but we seem to be just uh, muffing it left, right, and centre, and creating um, you know very concentrated, high-rise development, very small, very um, under-constructed, massive amounts of um, congestion and uh, life style and life sustainability just dropping away and in fact my suspicion is that the average age of the population will decrease on average over the next 20 to 30 years because yeah it could very well i mean at the moment it's obviously we're getting we're living longer and longer but it'll get to this point where it goes the other way yeah um the way we sort of hit the diminishing returns yeah um yeah unfortunately and look the, the weird thing is you now growing up um you know i grew up in you know, sort of middle class sort of neighborhood whatever uh and it was like I, I didn't really know. I knew one person. I think it was a a, a, a friend of mine who had a single mum or something lived in an apartment. But it was just like just normal to live in a house with a backyard and all that sort of stuff. And nowadays, it's like it's pretty rare uh, unless you're pretty wealthy to live in a house, especially in a decent area. Um, if you're a young person, so you know, or, or if you do, you got to you know obviously mortgage yourself to the eyeballs and be in a lifetime of debt. So it's just like that. Just small stuff like that is a dilution of your living standard uh, compared to the, you know, your, your parents' generation. And and my kids are going to have a harder than me. Um, you know, and it's just like for what? Why are we doing this? Um, you know, people don't want it, and yet this is being thrust upon us by our political leaders and by the by the growth lobby, who are doing it for their own profit because it's great for the one percenters and the capitalists because yeah. they own the land, they own the resources. And they can make some easy easy money out of this, um, but you know, for the for the ninety eight percent of Australians who who um, you know who who are made worse off by this, it's you know it, it, it's a lose lose for us. Yet the politicians don't care, and it's um, you know it's quite irritating. And and the, the the saddest thing is, even the Greens are probably the biggest mass immigration boosters. Uh, that that Australia has, like if you if you read all the comments from their immigration spokesman Nick McKinn, he is the biggest open borders advocate of the three major parties. So you got this sort of fake Greens party who promotes mass immigration more than anyone else, just about. Then you got a fake Labor party who's supposed to represent the workers who screwing them over on electricity and immigration and everything else. And then you got a corrupt coalition. So it's like you know who do you vote for? They're all suck. Uh, it's just the way it is, mate. Yeah. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's like this across pretty much all Anglo countries, but I, I because I live in Australia, I'm I'm obviously you know very attuned to Australia because this is where I live. Well, I have to say that having lived in the UK, I can tell you that it resonates significantly. Oh yeah, the Tories and all that, that's all the same stuff. Uh, and there's a couple of sort of thematics, right? One is the privatisation of public assets, again to create short term gain, as it were, but actually long term pain. I mean, look yeah, at the it creates problem. private taxes. So basically, we, yeah, we all we all get so called. Oh, you're paying less tax, but we're all paying taxes whether it's through toll roads and yep. whatever. It's just a form of taxation, except yep. it's, instead of going to the government, it's going to tra- Transurban or whoever else. It's like you know, disgusting. Yep. 
well, as I sometimes say, we are a cash flow. We are, we, we are basically people who just continue to pay for things. And, you know, that's... We're a profit centre. Yeah, we are. Well, we're, <laughs> we're being monetized. Right? That's it, yeah. You know, whatever we do. And, and, and I guess the other point is, I think you look at, it, you know, electricity and gas and all of those things, those are basic services required they should never have been privatised. No, 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 no natural monopoly should ever mm. have been privatised. Unfortunately, yep. we did. I mean, look, look, look I can't even argue here that, um, you know, we should never have privatised the Commonwealth Bank. Mm. Um, you know, why? what was the point of that? Uh, you know, certainly with Telstra, like, it was stupid privatising that. And at least if you're going to privatise it, keep the the assets, like the, the telephones and wires, et cetera, in public hands, and then you can privatise the business part of it, and then they can compete, you know, so... The, the natural monopoly bit, which is the the infrastructure bit, should always be in public hands. But unfortunately, you know, we haven't done that. We haven't done that with energy. Uh, we're, 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 you know, we've privatised energy and now we're all getting fleeced. Uh, it's just, you know, by foreign owned gas cartels, which the Chinese Communist Party has a hand in, you know, some of them. So it's just, um, you know, it, 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 it's bloody outrageous. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, this whole Reaganomics, Thatcherism, et cetera, this neoliberal, um, you know, experiment uh got thrust upon us and unfortunately it's still what's get, what's pretty much taught in universities etc which is which which is why it's such a hard thing to get off because it's indoctrinated in you um it was certainly indoctrinated in me and it wasn't you know when i started the treasury i was i was uh, i don't know i wouldn't say i was for all that stuff but it was basically what you knew and it wasn't really till I left Treasury and you know just started thinking for myself that you realize hang on this half this stuff's BS why are we doing this? And, um, you know, the last sort of 10 years doing macro or 10 plus years doing macro business has been unpicking all this stuff. Mm. And then once you know how the sausage is made, it's pretty rancid. Yep. Uh, I, I sometimes wish I was just ignorant about it all because I get really angry when I get a, you know, my last gas bill was 800 bucks for two, for 60 days and I was, I'm pretty tight. So I was very stingy on how we used it. And you're still getting fleeced, you know, 12 bucks a day for your gas when I used way less than I did the previous year and I paid $250 more. Mm. just because the price is rocketed. Yep. So it's just like, you know, that sort of stuff makes you angry. Absolutely. And, of course, it's not just the um, unit. It's also the fixed charge, which also seems to go... Sh oh, oh <laughs> yeah, the got Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, oh, mate, here's a quick one. I don't, I don't want to... Yeah. I won't take you much time, but, I, but I've basically, because of the gas gas cartel issue, and I'm in, in Melbourne, most older houses are on uh, ducted gas, so I've got ducted gas heating. I've been looking into basically changing to electric, so I thought I could just rip out my gas ducted you know, unit, chuck in an electric one. Um, it will use the same ducts and I'd be hunky-dory. Well, unfortunately, you can't do that. And I got my quote for the uh, electric ducted heating, uh, a lazy $15,500. And then it cost me another couple of grand to get three-stage power to run it. So not doing that. But, um, you know, you're caught between a rock and a hard place because it's like you can't use your gas because it's too expensive and it's going to go up even more. And then it's like, okay, I'll get a, you know, energy-efficient split, split system, you know, apparently it's, most most efficient form of heating you can get is a heat pump split system, but you got to pay you know seventeen eighteen grand for it. So it's like, yep. well, what do you do? Yep. You know. Well, and of course, a lot of people, um, you know, ordinary people can't afford. Oh, no, like if you're that. renting, if no. you're renting, you got gas ducted. What do you do? Yep. You got to pay it, yep. um, or you freeze. So especially in Melbourne, Melbourne's winters are brutal. Yeah. So That's um, right. you know, it's just it, it's really infuriating because because uh, gas used to be super cheap in Melbourne, mm. well, you know, but now it's like just going up like this. Yep. So uh, it's just untenable. And, and, and the point it? is, it's going to go on going up. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It's, and, it's and not like it's going to go up and stay there or come down again. It's going to. No. No. And uh, and, and look, they, they, these are the. Look, I, I, I think I said a couple of times ago, I said we don't have much domestically driven inflation in this country. Well, mm. true to a point, but we do because we've got. Um, we've obviously got the, the soaring rents haven't been captured yet in the CPI. Yep. Because the CPI is very lagged and it's showing that annual rental growth was 1.6% in the June quarter when all the private sector data is showing 10%. Um, so we're going to have a big spike in inflation once those rents filter through. And the other one's obviously this energy issue. So um, unfortunately, none, neither of these things can be fixed by interest rates. Um, and obviously the energy stuff could be fixed with government policy, but they're refusing not to do it, which just means we're going to get higher interest rates than we should otherwise. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty uh, infuriating. Let's just go back to rentals briefly because, you know, we've sort of touched on it, but I, I made a show for uh, this channel the other day highlighting 
the disaster that rental is. I mean, it's absolutely disastrous. Oh, it's, right? it is it is the biggest housing problem we've yep. got. Like everyone talks about prices all the time, but yep. rents is really where the rubber hits the road. Yep. And we've got more people in rental stress in my surveys than we've ever had. It's sort of 61%, 62% of those renting are now having difficulty ma making those rents. Yep. Um, and, and there's really no sense from anywhere from a public perspective or government perspective of, of it being a problem, it seems to me. It's like it's the problem that nobody wants to talk about. Yeah, and unfortunately, because it affects poorer people, uh, generally they're, they're the ones who always get shafted the most. So, so renters are renters. So, someone in uh, public housing, which is, I guess, a subset of renters, are ignored the most. Mm. And then renters, private sector renters, are sort are ignored the second most. And then governments will always pander to first home buyer grants, et cetera, et cetera, to try and bribe home buyers. When really the focus should be on um, should be on the rental market because that's where you got obviously the poorer segments of society usually the most vulnerable, and it's also really where the where, where the biggest need is mm. um you know we've got record low rental vacancies at the moment we've got rents going up 10 percent uh, across most markets like double digits let's just put this in because this is actually yeah. the core logic data right yeah that's right mm. look this is this is mirrored by prop track or by mm. um you know domain or SQM research they're all telling the same story that effectively you've got national rental growth of 10 percent thereabouts Differences between the markets, small difference, but pretty much everywhere it's strong, particularly strong in Brisbane, because it's obviously had a lot of the inward migration from Melbournians escaping, um, escaping the bastard case down here. Um, but, you know, it's the same, similar story across the whole nation. Rents are incredibly tight. They're rocketing. Combined capitals, regions, doesn't matter. And at the same time, you've got rental vacancy rates, uh, you know, at basically 1.1% nationally, which is the lowest on record according to CoreLogic. So they've got the highest rental growth on record uh, according to their records and the lowest rental vacancies on record. And this is coming, as I said before, and the chart on the right shows, at the same time as uh, net overseas migration hit its highest ever level in March, in the March quarter, 96,200. And under the Albanese government's you know big, big Australia push, it's going to continue rocketing next year which means that the rental market is just going to get smashed even more and it's coming at the same time as dwelling construction is going to fall off a cliff because all the homes that have been built under the home builder stimulus are starting to come online now like they've been you know getting worked through that pipeline there's nothing really after that pipeline and then you've got a lot of builders obviously going bust because of the soaring uh, construction costs um so we've got this disaster brewing where we're going to have a massive flood of people the market's already tight. We're going to have less construction to fill, uh, you know, to obviously cater for those people. So all that means is that vacancy is going to tank, rents are going to soar, and going to have way more people uh, that that become homeless. Homeless. So it's an absolute, you know, disaster uh, that's basically facing Australia, and it's bad enough now, and it's going to get worse. And the only way it can, I guess, be mitigated is if we have a reversal of trend from from the pandemic. So the pandemic saw. Um, migration obviously slowed to a halt over the pandemic, yet rents, rental vacancies still fell and rents still rose, which is kind of counterintuitive. But the reason for that was we had all this obviously work from home um, became you know the the norm across a lot of industries. So people needed more space, they needed home offices, etc. So the number of people per dwelling shrank. The census showed that, and unless that reverses to what it was pre-COVID, which it won't, because people are still working from home, and pretty much that's going to become the norm to at least work from home a couple of days a week, you're going to get this massive rental squeeze. So you had this sort of pandemic shift in the number of people per dwelling falling. And unless that goes back, uh, the rental base is going to stay low. And then you're going to have hundreds of thousands of people piling on top of that. So it's uh, yeah, it's a really, really poor outlook for the rental market. Um, you know, and then, so yeah, look, as bad as it is, if you have a mortgage and you've got to pay higher mortgage rates, I feel more uh, for people who are trying to rent, who are just, you know, seeing 10, 20% rental lifts or just can't get a home or have been forced into group accommodation or at worst been forced into homelessness because it's a lot worse for them. It's really is the worst situation.
Yeah, and there's a couple of observations. One is in the census, there was more than a million vacant properties reported in the census, right? It always says that, though. Yeah. Like to, to, yeah. to be fair, I don't think that was an increase. It pretty much always says there's about a million. It, it, it's about a million plus. But in there, there are some which are Airbnbs. Yeah, yeah right? Airbnb, massive problem. Be because we know that quite a few people have given up on long-term rentals, although through COVID, they actually went to long-term rentals. Yeah, right? yeah which actually caused a spike in vacancy at the start and then it reversed. Correct, yeah. right. Uh, and then as COVID sort of eased off the other side, um, they got they kicked out those long-term uh, holders of uh, you know, the rental properties and went back to the Airbnb short-term rentals because they actually yeah. made, a, made a, bigger, a bigger return, you know, for less wear and tear on the property. Uh, now, it's really tough to try and get data on how many properties are airbnb across the country. Yeah, it's, it's only so you can go to sort of Airbnb Watch. I think there's a, I've put up a few posts in the past, mm. um, but I don't know how reliable it is. Uh, no. It double counts, et cetera. But it, it certainly is, um, I'd say it's quite significant and it's been a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm doing some work on this. At the moment, I reckon there's at least 350 to 4, 350,000 to 400,000 properties across the country that are airbnb I wouldn't be surprised. And, and, and you know, uh, five six years ago, that would have been negligible. Probably. Correct, much. I mean, much I mean, they, they they might have been some of those. Would have, you know, if you're in the Gold Coast or something, mm. it might have been um, ones that are managed by real estate agencies and they're doing it in house now. But yep. but that aside, they definitely it's taken a lot of rental stock off the market. Yep, we just don't know exactly what it is. Uh, and and that lack of transparency is part of the problem, right? Yeah, because, oh, totally. because councils don't know, don't care. Well, I think they should. So that's one yeah. of the things that I'm pushing for is to get greater transparency of, of, of Airbnb because it seems to me that they are actually um, commercial businesses and they should be, you know, charged and taxed as commercial businesses rather than just as a, a property for rent. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, that, that, that probably requires some sort of, I don't know, act of parliament, whatever, which they should do. And if, if the, if well, the Albanese government cares, most, they should do it. Most of it's state-based. Oh, yeah. Well, that, right. that's the other Pandora's box. Correct. We're trying to get all the states to do it. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, get, then again, you only need one to move first. Um, and then hopefully, you know, some others follow. But, yeah, we, we all know the way it works here. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, property's protected no matter what. The sec second point is that if you look at the number of property investors now compared with then, it's actually going down. Yeah. So we're actually seeing some property investors quitting. And that means that those properties, you know, are no longer available for rent. They might be sold, that you know, who knows. But but that's something else that again people aren't talking about, right? So in fact Yeah, that, although that 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 one's that one's interesting because mm. um I think that's only an issue if the investors are uh it, to the extent that investors aren't buying off the plans. So mm. that's right. But yeah, obviously if you've got a pre existing home and you're an investor and you quit you're going to sell it and you're either going to sell it to another investor or an owner occupier so it doesn't actually that that, that probably doesn't disappear unless it's kept vacant um it doesn't shouldn't actually impact the rental supply demand balance mm. because if you're a obviously if you're an if, you know if you're an investor and you go oh, no, yeah i'm sick of i'm sick of this the my mortgage rate's gone up by 50 basis points higher than when owner occupier pays they've got this i don't know land tax whatever it is you don't for some reason you don't want to do it anymore and you quit will you sell and you either sell to another investor or you sell to a owner occupier. So it shouldn't really impact the rental supply demand balance, except unless you get in a big knockout of investors buying off the plans. Yeah. Um, well, and yeah, I don't know if there's any data on that. Uh, well, there is a little bit, but it's again fra fragmented. But we also yeah. know that in some areas there are still properties that were never occupied. Yeah. So they were in bought, fact, not Airbnb. Not actually occupied, just held probably vacant. more apartments. I imagine well, there'd be quite a lot of those ghost apartments. Docklands, for example. <laughs> yeah, classic. Right? Yeah. And in fact, if you look at the vacancy rates in Docklands on census night, it was extremely high. I think twenty-two percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm sure a lot of those are sold to foreign foreign uh, investors as well. And, because and, yeah. Now, but again, that data is not actually known by you know the councils and uh, you know. So again, this is another example where we don't actually know what's going on. Yeah. So well, it's interesting because uh, just just on that, there, mm. there was three houses. So I've lived in my suburb Ashburton in Melbourne for 
since 2006. And there was three houses within a couple of hundred, about 200 metres from where I live mm. that were for like an eight, nine years were vacant. Um, they were just like, I couldn't believe it. I, I knew they were vacant, I used to go past. And then I, I heard, you know, you speak to neighbours and like, yeah, that house vacant. Interestingly, all those three places in the last couple of years have become occupied, which is, uh, I know it's a tiny example. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. It's just my area. But it's just, um, I don't know why anyone would, would leave their house vacant. Like it just, it's a red rag to a bull for, you know, something going wrong, not being maintained. When you lock things up, it becomes musty. Yep. Um, you can get squatters, you know, all this sort of stuff. It doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, that you, you walk around the suburbs, there's probably one house on every street just about that's been vacant. Mm. That that that's that's vacant. You don't necessarily know it. Um, yeah, it's just bonkers. Uh, and that's the, that's right. So, so again, my, my point is this, and I'm just using this as a few examples, right? When you think about housing and housing policy, right, these issues should be part of the story, but they're not, right? And then the Productivity Commission came out a couple of weeks ago and said all those first owner grants, actually they're directed in the wrong place. All you're doing is yeah. lifting price, which you and I have been saying for a long, long oh, time. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, mate, anyone with half a brain <laughs> knows, knows, knows that's well, the Well, the Productivity Commission must have half a brain because they've, they've come up yeah. with two. And they actually yeah, said, yeah, man, they said... They said instead to put it in the rental market. Correct, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So redirect so social housing. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and, 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 and that's actually one of the biggest problems we've got. So... Hmm. And again, this comes down to the whole privatisation thing that you're talking about before. So, we, you know, we had basically had governments got out of public housing in, in pretty much the 80s. They stopped doing it. And they just left it to the private market. And obviously, you know, we've got this situation where we're bringing in, like, especially the last 15, 16 years, have brought in literally millions of people from overseas, yet the investment in social housing just has plummeted. So the social housing stock's been falling. Yep while the number of people in the country has risen and the demand's been rising. So it's just creating these chronic problems because the government has decided, oh, it, you know, government shouldn't do this sort of stuff anymore. Whereas they did it fine over the post-war period and, you know, up to the 70s, whatever, mm. and it worked. But then for Thatcherism, whatever you want to call it, they just stopped doing this stuff. Well, the point is, if, if, if property is built by government, you don't have to make a profit. Yeah. Right. Whereas if you actually it's built by the private sector, they only want to make a profit. Yeah, so that, and that changes yeah, the mix yeah. of the property and all sorts of things. Yeah, totally. And um, yeah, one of the worst things they did in Melbourne was they uh, would happen everywhere else. Like the, the suburb next door to me, Ashwood and Chadson, used to have heaps of um, those sort of concrete, you know, post-war homes. And it was all social housing when I was growing up. Like that was all, and now it's all private. Mm. So uh, they pretty much just decided to sell them a lot. And, um, you know, obviously they did it for a quick buck in the in the 90s when they were stretched for money and they sold them for a pittance. Uh, and, you know, we don't have that social housing anymore. Uh, and, that, and that's happened right across the country. Yep. Well, cr across a lot of Western countries, actually. You, yeah. You can. Yeah, which again example. gets down to this Reaganomics, Thatcherism, et cetera. Right. Well, that's where I wanted to get to. So, so Liz Truss basically is saying we're going to cut taxes at the top end. We're going to make... The richer people even richer because the crops are going to borrow to do it. Yeah, we're going to borrow <laughs> to do it, and then we're going yeah. to let that trickle down. All right, the trickle down e economics. Now, I'm pretty skeptical because I don't believe it, that that has proven to be working. It's never for, worked. No. So I guess the question is, why is it that at this time that's now coming back into vogue and it's being spoken about? And it's because just they've got no alternatives, or is this something else going on? What do you think? I don't know. I think it's uh, probably the rich, the the, the wealthy donors. Mm. The um, you know, it, I mean, it's sort of happening here a bit with the stage three tax cuts. When you think about it, like those, those who are pumping, who are, who are pining for these things, uh, were more well connected, more politically connected, and they're you know, it's whether they're CEOs, whatever, they're all they're all pushing for this stuff behind the scenes, um, and they're and they're organised. It's the same as the reason why we get. You know the big, the big Australian mass immigration from the from the growth lobby. Um, that's the only thing I can, reason why I think they're doing it. Um, bit of corruption, that sort of thing. Because you know, certainly economically, it makes absolutely zero sense. Yes. And the markets, the markets gave them the treatment for it. Yep. <laughs> you know, it basically turned them into a you know develop, developing country junk. Um, yeah, look, look the, the, this 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 trickle down stuff has never worked. Uh, it's a recipe for you know greater inequality and. 
as a counterpoint, you look at what the Scandinavian countries do. Yep. And they don't suffer from any of this crap. Uh, I'm not saying they're perfect. No, no country's perfect. But, um, you know, they, they do the opposite approach. And you argue that their social cohesion is greater. Their, well, their equality is certainly a lot better. And their living standards overall are higher. So, um, you know, you've got these two different models. And unfortunately, for some reason, these Anglo countries have all decided to go down the sort of neoliberal trickle-down route, um, which is, you know, crazy because I thought all this stuff was dispelled. Like mm. this this whole trickle-down myth, I thought it would become pretty much understood that it doesn't work. And yet you've got, this, got the trust government doubling down and doing the biggest dose of Reaganomics you've ever seen. Yeah, and quoting the Laffer curve and, you know, those, you yeah, know, we, yeah. if you put taxes up too high, people you know, find ways not to pay tax. If you take it down yeah. a bit, then they, they pay more tax. Yeah, just, just just like in the Scandinavian countries. Yeah, it happens heaps there, doesn't it? It's crazy. <laughs> but but I guess the point I'm trying to get to is there are some philosophical assumptions about the way that economies work, right? Yeah. It's overlaid by a whole bunch of, of politics and power, right? And so actually there are very few decisions taken purely from an economic perspective, it's almost always contaminated by... It's all the ideology. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always uh, ideological, yep. this sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it, it's not based on empirical analysis or even bloody common sense. <laughs> it's just this belief in the market, you know, this, this, this amazing yes. you know, invisible hand all, that's going to sort it out. Yeah, 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 when, yeah. But, but, but you look across everything, like all the privatisations, well, not all of them, but, you know, just about every, just about all of the privatisations yep. have gone bad when yep. you look at it. Um, they've gotten bad outcomes. And then it's just like, oh, look, you know, let's do more. <laughs> let's just, well, hang on, it didn't work the last 20 times you tried it. So what do you, you know, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, the the UK's experiment was probably the, the most egregious um modern well recent example i've seen uh where <laughs> it's just like well, are we in the 1980s here like back you know back then it was um it was kind of hadn't been tested yet and they just had this you know uh theory that it would all work i know because of freedman whatever but the um but we've had 30 years to show it didn't work and yet they're doubling down and you know going to do it again and the hope that it's definition of insanity yeah, it is, but it does seem to be a flavour of the day, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I think we're going to hear, hear more of it. Though, as you say, in the UK, um, they're getting more and more resistance because more and more parts of the Conservative Party are now saying, well, hang on a moment, we don't want that bit, we don't want this bit, so <laughs> it'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah, well, the, 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 the most hilarious thing is um, uh, Boris Johnson, before he got booted, was like doing, a, uh, doing an ad or something. I saw it on YouTube, it was hilarious. Um, Whereas basically telling people, oh, if you buy this energy efficient kettle, you can save twelve pounds a year in your energy bill. I mean, it's like doing all this sort of crap because they're obviously getting absolutely squeezed over there. Yes. At the same time, so, you know, um, his successor only a few weeks later is handing out these massive tax cuts to well, wants to hand out massive tax yeah. cuts to the rich and then use quantitative easing to basically pay for it. It's just um, you know, you're in bizarre world when this kind of stuff happens. Absolutely. Well, I'm afraid there's a lot of bizarre stuff in the world of economics. It's <laughs> go, yeah. goes with the temperature because of course it's not it's it's what I call applied economics because it's it's sort of contaminated with, with, with all this other stuff. But look, as we come to the end of the show, um so my my take is that you think that there will be small increases in the cash rate from this point but at some point in the middle of next year or so they're going to have to turn turtle and say oh we've made a mistake we've gone too hard um yeah uh, yeah look i mean obviously my confidence in in uh in, in that is you know not super high because mm. just who the hell knows what's going to happen at the moment but um look I, I mean i'm fairly confident i think they'll do a cut do they'll do 0.5 percent increases now and probably a couple more um just because the impact of what the rate rises have had haven't been felt yet. And, you know, whether it be Christmas time or there just soon after, I think it's going to hit us in the face. And obviously I still think, you know, I think it's pretty obvious we're going to head into some sort of global recession next year. And Australia is not going to be immune, especially if we don't solve the energy stuff. Um, so by that stage, I, you know, I would be surprised if central banks everywhere are cutting rates. Um, sometime mid next year, maybe now next next year. Who knows? Like second half of next year, maybe. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, th I think they'll be forced to forced to do a U turn, um, just because they went too hard. And uh, you know, and 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 then by then, mate, like latter half of next year, who knows? The housing market might be off to the races again. Mm. Um, so, so two two questions: unemployment would probably rise. 
Oh, I, I think it's a photo complete. Yeah. So if you actually look at the um, internet job vacancies, the yep. National Skills Commission They're put out today. They're coming down, aren't they? Yeah, yeah oh, it's definitely well past yep. peak. Like, it's like three months past peak now. Yep. So basically, it's still at a high level, like in actual level terms. But the the job market is clearly weakening already, and that's shown in the job vacancy data, and it'll soon be captured in the ABS as well. So it's already turned a corner, and that's to be expected with the RBA hiking so aggressively. Um, but then next year, given the Albanese's government's um, immigration policies, we're going to get a massive increase in labour supply because you're going to have literally hundreds of thousands of people coming here. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I honestly think next year is going to be a record migration year. So yep. it'll beat the 2009, I think, when we had 315,000. And that alone means tons and tons of labour supply. So, you know, if the jobs growth slows and then you have a ton of labour supply coming, well, the result is big spike in unemployment. So the reduction in immigration is the prime reason why the unemployment rates tanked to lowest levels since 1974. Mm. So if you do the reverse of that and you do the biggest immigration intake ever at the same time as the economy slows, effectively the opposite of what we had during the pandemic, we had stimulus and negative immigration. You can have the opposite of unstimulus from the RBA and um, lower discretionary income because of rising cost, you know, rising energy prices, et cetera, meeting higher labour supply. So it's the opposite. It's basically, a, basically a, a, the reverse of what happened during the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, I think next year we're going to have a big spike in unemployment, going to have lower wage growth again, which means real wages are going to go backwards even faster. Uh, and then we're going to have the central banks, or well, RBA, um, and central banks globally being forced to cut. So, And then after that, who knows, the property market might be off to the races again after a nice big haircut. Um, and yeah. I'll be here to call it when it happens. Yeah, I was going to say, where it goes up, whether it's still something to write about. Oh, no, 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 I'll pump it. I'll, I'll pump it the other way. I'll, I'll turn <laughs> bullish. Like, honestly, I, I'm, I'm expecting to turn bullish the next uh, six or six or so months. I don't okay. know. Like, I, it, once it'll happen, the RBA will stop stop hiking at some point mm. for the next, I don't know, whether it's three months or something. Then it'll be pausing for a number of months. And then when it looks like it's turning and they're going to start cutting, and you only get the housing market's going to keep falling for months after that. But, you know, mid next year, it might be time to go bullish because. The, um, we know once the RBA starts cutting again, and if it does, cuts like, say, 100 basis points off the cash rate, well, that's going to increase borrowing capacity and yep. the, hey, the housing market would have already taken a pretty big haircut by then. And, you know, and given we've got mass immigration, we're going to have John Elmer's immigration, we're going to have record type supply, even though those things are sort of, you know, longer term factors. Um, you know, that that's the ingredients for rising house prices again. So, uh, and my suggestion is April will turn around and say, "Well, you know that three percent buffer. Well, rates oh, yeah. have, rates have gone That's up, true. so you don't need it to be three now, you know, because it's never going to yeah, go higher yeah. than that, right?" So, yep. yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, it's going to be a complete reversal. So, it'll, it, and, and and you know, what one thing the pandemics taught um, taught us and is if you want to, you know, I guess forecast. I'm I'm crap at forecasting, but if you want to, you know, know the direction of house prices, just follow the interest rates. Uh, and, and and it's taken me a while, it took me like years to actually work it out properly, but it all gets down to that borrowing capacity. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you went like currently the borrowing capacity has shrunk, some measures are, you know, 23% or whatever. Others, if you use a mortgage calculator, I use it's 36%, but yep. I don't know what the mortgage brokers use. But it's, you know, it, the, the mortgage, the borrowing capacity has been slashed by at least a quarter Yep, from the, from the rate hikes we've had. Um, and obviously, if they go the other way and they start cutting rates, well, then the borrowing capacity rises. So that means, you know, other things equal it means rising prices. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's the single best indicator interest rates for the uh, for the property market, and and obviously, you know, um, lending. Uh, what do you call it? The ease of getting credit, which is related anyway. Um, so that that's the thing to watch if you want to see what's going to happen to house prices. But I I don't think they'll start rising until the RBA. You know, well, they might just before they cut, they might rise a little bit if it's been paused for six months or something. But you know, once they cut, it'll be off to the races again, I think. So, and f final question the exchange rate with 662 at the moment. Um, I'm thinking it might even go lower than that. Oh, I think it definitely will yeah. because, um, the interest rate differ differential is mm. going to get uh, worse with the Fed and also commodity prices. Uh, look like they're already coming off, and the Australian dollar, you know, historically has tracked commodity prices to a significant extent. So, 
th- those two things alone would be pretty bearish on um on uh on, on the australian dollar so um yeah it's if we actually exported anything which wasn't um you know minerals yes. it'd be really good for competitiveness but we don't really do that anymore so yeah doesn't matter <laughs> indeed well, look, I, we, we've got to the end of our time. Um, I want to say thank you, Leith, for once again um, taking us through your thoughts and uh, really appreciate it. And I know there's lots of comments uh, about uh, appreciation there too. Um, we will just highlight again, uh, you are going to be on there on the 19th of October along with uh, some of the other guys from um, Macro Business and Nucleus Wealth. 19th of October yep. in Melbourne, starting in the early evening. The links are below. So if you'd like to sign up and go along, do. Be warmly welcome. It'll be a fun, fun evening, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the, mm. the, the the last couple, well, pre-COVID ones were always good fun. So uh, yeah. I, I'm just going to hope that I can still fit in my suit. I've already got, I've already got one suit, so uh, <laughs> it's one more than I've got. <laughs> yeah, I just don't wear them anymore. So hopefully it still fits. Otherwise, um, yeah, I should try that in the next few days to make sure it still fits. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and I'm sure you'll be back on again uh, down the track as as things progress. I always enjoy speaking with you. So thank you for taking yeah, time no. out of your Tuesday evening. No worries. Thanks very much. I was a bit ranchy tonight, so uh, hopefully right. I don't know if that went, went across well or not. I was, I was no, on the, no. well, I was on the tee, but I was just a little bit ramped up about the uh, about the whole energy thing because it really <laughs> infuriates me. One thing that gets my like every time Dave writes an article on it, my blood pressure goes up. I think uh, you know at least five points. <laughs> well, I think it's totally appropriately. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. I want to take you offline, and I'll close the show. See you later. No worries. See, See you guys. Here. Thanks. Bye-bye. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed that. That was a. Always great fun. Just to say that uh, next week, um, I've got Chris Bates coming on. He's going to talk about property from, whoops, Chis Bates. I misspelled it. Chris Bates, it should be. Uh, so he'll be on next uh, week uh, on the 18th, and we'll be talking specifically about things from a mortgage broking perspective, which should be fun. And I will just have a quick look at the poll. So I did put a poll up to start the, uh, th- the show, which was where will the uh, next rate rise be? And we've got basically 46% saying 50 basis points, 44% 25 basis points, uh, 9% hold and 1% saying cut. So there you go. That's what what the uh, audience thinks. So uh, I'll post that there. So I want to say thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, Check back next week for the next live show with Chris and obviously the recorded shows during the week. I'll see you next time. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.